It's so exciting to have everyone here for this new series. This is our first one in person. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Meredith Smith, who's our science producer in the science studios here at Pioneer Works for making this awesome. Uh, what would I do without Meredith? I'm really honored to be able to introduce our guest tonight, Marlon James. Marlon is the author of the Booker Prize winning novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. He is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Woo -woo! These and his other books have garnered a large number of prizes, including relevant for tonight's topic, the LA Times Ray Bradbury Award in Science Fiction. And we're here to celebrate his second book in the Dark Star Trilogy. Um, I was, I was going to mess up the name, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Moon Witch Spider King. Please join me in welcoming Marlon James. Come, friend. <laughs> so I, this is really exciting. I just feel like I've just been let out after a plague or something like that. Huh, it's really weird. Feeling. The plague's over? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, so speaking of epics, mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about Sogolon, the Moon Witch. So Sogolon is the narrator for mm -hmm. this book, and. She begins her story with this brutal childhood, which she calls, uh, she's recalling in a dream jungle as though she's recounting someone else's story before she even has a name. Mm -hmm. And we meet Sogolon earlier in the first book. Yeah. And I, I, one of my questions for you, um, none of this is recounted in the first book, of course, this whole history of who Sogolon is. We, when we meet her, she's a 177-year-old avenger and assassin. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, when you were writing the trilogy in the beginning with the first book, with Black Leopard, Red Wolf, did you know Sogolon was going to be the narrator for the second book? Um, I didn't know until maybe midway in the first book when I realized that there are these huge sections of Moon, Black Leopard where she kind of disappears. And, um, but I also, because of that, she just became, start to be really, really interesting to me. And also because Tracker has such a low opinion of her. <laughs> so uh, Tracker is the narrator of Black Leopard, Red Wolf. It's the narrator of Black, of, of Black Leopard, Red Wolf. And um, I don't necessarily trust his opinion on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and I, I knew that she because she was I knew I wanted an older narrator, somebody who has a bigger sense of things, and and. Um, and Tracker's quite young. He is quite young, and he is he, he, he even and even you know with that notwithstanding, he also takes a very long time to grow up. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, mm -hmm. um, you know I think in in Black Liberty he was saying that. Sogolon was like 300 years old. Yeah. Is she or is he nah. mistaken? Because I'm not sure you can trust Sogolon either because her own memory of her <laughs> life isn't reliable. Well, I mean, you know, it's like what people say about memoir. It's still just one person's opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's one of the things that um, when I was writing this, the, both novels and, and, and writing the third, that I, you know, I realized that truth is something that the reader is going to have to arrive at themselves mm -hmm. because I wasn't interested in you know this idea of this authentic version this director's cut this kind of um, we have this way of, of looking at truth as this, as this process of reduction which is a very western thing to do mm -hmm. um, you know when you like when I was growing up my grandfather would tell me Nancy stories and um, you know, he'd have like a different story every night. It's not until like the fourth day I realized it's the same characters appearing <laughs> in each story, but they're doing very different things. And I go, how can he be the hero of Monday and the trickster of Thursday? What am I supposed to believe about this character? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what I was left with is, is exactly what he left me, which is that the burden of choosing who to believe is on, you know, is going to be on the... On the reader, when I wrote Black Leopard, I believe Tracker. When I wrote this, I believe Sogolod. No, they don't like each other very much. Not these really. two narrators, and they, they want to kill each other. Yeah, which is why I knew I had, had her tell the second story. 
um, somebody with an extreme version of, of, of extreme reaction to someone like Tracker. And the funny thing about, um, the, the, about writing a novel like this, though, is I had to sort of forget the first book. Um, because then all I would have written, all I would have written was a, just a rebuttal of the first one, and a response to the first one. And if all she's doing is responding to Tracker, then she's saying Tracker is important, mm -hmm. and Tracker barely appears. So right, he barely appears in her account, and she barely appears in his account. Mm -hmm. Though they're powerful forces in both. You don't know much about either of them. Mm -hmm. And just to give people, because I know not everyone's read the book, um, or either of the books, a sense of what's at stake. Here you have Tracker who joins Sogolon in a kind of fraught alliance mm -hmm. to save a missing boy or find a missing boy, and what's at stake is really the kingdom. Right. And, um, and so here are these people of these humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. Really, um, Tracker is mocked for being a river people, and Sogolon is from the bush, and yet they end up playing these pivotal roles, really, in the fate of their world, mm -hmm. the North and the South Kingdom. So a lot is at stake, but it's told mm -hmm. from their perspectives. Yeah, I, because, I, you know, um, to me, a fantasy novel, in a lot of ways, is a historical novel with witches in it. Um, and... I, and the thing about a lot of history is it's about, a lot of it, certainly the, the, the stuff I read tend to be about the story of people who impact other people, but we never get the history of the other people or the people being impacted. And I remember when I was starting writing this whole trilogy, I was writing it like any other fantasy about the fall of a royal house, and there's a prince this and a queen that, and I couldn't be more bored. <laughs> it's, it's like William and Kate were in Jamaica when I was in Jamaica and I'm like God at least be interesting <laughs> it's, it's oh my god it, it, I want to get it how dull they are but anyway um, but, that's, but that's also how bored I was with that story I literally had this sort of plot points and I actually turned the book upside down mm -hmm. and then it made sense it was always this sort of royal house filtering down to the right. people in the street, and I flipped it upside down. And I go, what if you start with the people in the street? Right. And, and that's what happened. But um, particularly in Sogolon's case, Sogolon is somebody who is sort of royalty adjacent, but not royalty, mm -hmm. which kind of reminded me a little bit when I was growing up in Jamaica, I was rich people adjacent, <laughs> but not rich. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> Yeah, um, but but she is she she's somebody who is smack in the middle of where everything happens, but outside it, mm -hmm. and sometimes forcibly kicked outside it, mm -hmm. and that gives her a, you know a perspective. But I think she even more so than than Tracker starts to wonder about who is this person we're saving anyway, mm -hmm. and what yeah. is this what is this way of life we're gonna save, and why are we protecting? You know, why are we protecting basically a tyrant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, it's unlike the sort of Christian norms of these stories that you're describing and that mm -hmm. there's no truly virtuous person in the entire book and there's really no clear benevolent outcome to even hope for. Mm. It's filled with mm. doubt. Well, yeah. Well, one, I, I, I definitely didn't want to you know, do that sort of truly virtuous kind of thing. Um, the one thing both both bo um, books have in common is that they sort of tear a hole in this magic child who would lead us bullshit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Tracker is like, you know, I mean, if, he, if, if Tracker can't see it, smoke it, smell it, or fuck it, he doesn't care. And Sogolon is like, this is the future. Right. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah. let's, sorry, go so, ahead. So, no, but it's, it's um, again, that... Um, what, what that sort of, I wasn't interested in that kind of fantasy as Christian allegory. Cause I think then that becomes a very Western thing and that's one of the criticisms level that fantasy, which is a valid criticism, that for a lot of it, it sort of props up Western civilization. Mm -hmm. it's, it, a lot of it is sort of a revisionist telling of the Dark Ages. And so on, and, and, and the characters, so it's not even necessarily that there, it's not even a matter of that there are no be, there's no benevolent character. I think there, that, that looking for that is also looking for a sort of Christian value in a, in a landscape that was not that at all. 
Sogolon's character is so fascinating in this. There's a line that really struck me as kind of encapsulating who she becomes. Mm -hmm. um, she says at one point when she's asked to rescue somebody, she says, I did not tell her that I don't kill women. And I was not going to confirm if the woman was spoiled or not. Mm -hmm. For women can't spoil. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very powerful line. And I was wondering if you could help explain this to those who haven't read the book yet. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things there. It's, it's even the, 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 um, the person, so Soglan at some point becomes somebody who, yeah, she becomes a kind of an avenging, avenging angel. But she also doesn't have time for a lot of the, the, the ways in which women are judged or, or um, defined. Uh, even in even in the ways in which their people define victimhood, so the idea of somebody who's say sexually violated is now spoiled, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that 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 person wanted confirmation that the person is still a virgin, and she's like, no, nah, I don't get done with that shit. <laughs> For one, I'm not I'm not gonna undress her and do do you know a quick hymen search. I'm not Ti the rapper, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> Wasn't so, that crazy? What the hell? <laughs> well, Sogolon is also ferocious, and mm -hmm. she becomes enlisted by women to avenge them. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I don't think it's possible to spoil this book because it's so complex mm -hmm. um, that I, I don't even feel like I have to do spoiler alerts, but this is a very defining um, character for this the evolution of, of Sogolon from the time she acquires the name Moon Witch, which is mm -hmm. foisted on her. Yeah. She never, to the end, uh, agrees to the title witch. She doesn't think she's a witch. Mm -hmm. So who is Sogolon if she's not a witch? Because she certainly, she certainly has strengths that mm -hmm. are otherworldly. I think Sogolon is, is um, more than anything else, a woman who insists on defining herself um, in the presence of being constantly defined. But she also reserved the right to have, have that be a process. So for her, even I don't know who I am is still legit because I'm the one deciding. Um, you know, uh, Sogolon actually takes the name Sogolon. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she, um, she's not named at the beginning of the book. So even that is an act of self-possession. And I think for her, it's always that. There's a huge section, not a huge section, but a, a lot of time passes where she's just basically in wild bush while yeah. certain types of gorillas are trying to make her their wife. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and she spends most of it sleeping. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it, for her, it's, um, again, choosing to define herself even if that's no definition at all. And I think that is, is what's important to her because she's seen it. She's seen, she's seen a very height of power mm -hmm. and it really ain't shit. Mm -hmm. and, and she's seen if, if you are an untouchable princess queen and you can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why she, she hesitates to the word witch is that witch is used throughout the novel as a means to separate and destroy women, mm -hmm. which by the way is still happening. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's still happening, which is, um, just as in, in the first novel, children being called Mingi and tossed about are, is still happening. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for, for, for her, the term, funny enough, Moon Witch is not a term she claimed. It's not a situation where I'm going to take this phrase that everybody uses and reclaim it. She didn't reclaim it. It's, it's the woman she helped who named her that. They reclaim it for her. And you know, they're near the end of the book when, when women start to tell her Moon Witch, she's me. Yeah, you that's know? an incredible scene. Yeah. Um, right, where the women start to all call themselves Moon Witch. Mm -hmm. um, Tracker, as you said, has his own variant of the story of this alliance to save this child who turns out not to be the savior that they had been led to believe he was. Mm -hmm. and, 
really the story is less about the mission in some sense than it is about the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And as you said, uh, these books are not, they're not linear. I actually right. read the second book first. Mm -hmm. And then I read the first book and it absolutely works. It's very exciting yeah. because they have their I own. Kinda envy. I kind of envy you. I keep wanting to talk to you people who read the second book first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very exciting when you get to the moments of overlap because here are mm -hmm. these characters who are missing from their own stories largely. They each play a powerful role but they don't know each other that well and they don't understand each other, don't like each other, mm -hmm. want to kill each other. But when there are moments of overlap, it's, it's very exciting. You think, you know, I've been in this ruin before. I've been in this mm -hmm. woods before. I've been in this, and I know this story. And then it quickly pivots and you follow one of them. Yeah. down some other trail while Sogolon disappears and Tracker went on with his life. Um, and I'm wondering, at, in your process of writing it, are you discovering the book as you go along? Yeah. Are you writing, like, is your process, do you have storyboards? Do you have I, it all plotted so out? I, you know, I, I'm an exhaustive planner and I'm exhaustive plotter and I have books and notebooks and notebooks with just plot lines, plot lines, plot lines. And then I start writing and ignore all of it. <laughs> um... <laughs> Because the characters, at least for me anyway, start to become people. Mm -hmm. And they go in directions I would never expect it. And now for me, you know, for me a good writing day is at the end of the day I go, man, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and uh, there are parts of the book where Sogolum, you know, not, I don't think it's a spoiler, but you know, Sogolum says at one point, I'm a woman with children. And she's as stunned with that about that as we are. In fact, she's so stunned, she walks around the house at night just shouting their names, like, what the hell am I doing with kids? <laughs> yeah. and, and, but that, I, that was not something I had plotted. It's not something I sort of wrote down and said, we're going to come to it, um, even though I do that a lot. So it's, it's, you know, I just think at some point, Certainly, characters become people, and they just stop taking shit from me. <laughs> and I start to feel like I am the one just holding on for dear life, as these characters do what they they want to do. You know, you know, for me, I think I'm somewhere with a character when they start to surprise and when they start to disappoint, <laughs> which they do in equal measure with me. Have do they do they haunt you these characters <laughs> when you finish the book? Not, Do they go away? I don't know, <laughs> sort of, but that's because I write such big books. <laughs> um, they, I, I, yeah, I, um, I don't think the characters are true. Because I know I'm going to get back to them soon, they don't have time to haunt me. <laughs> right. As I do. Whereas a character from Book of Night Woman, which is my second novel, still, mm -hmm. you know, I still stand as wonder. I wonder what she's up to. <laughs> Um, She's hanging out with the Moon Witch. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I, I, you know, I, I, if every now and then I, I resist sequels. I remember um, Russell Banks talking about a character in his book. I think it's a Lost Memory of Skin, and he said he brought her back because she was, she was in the sweet hereafter. And a, lot, a lot of people blamed her for the huge tragedy that happens in that book. A lot of children die, mm -hmm. and he always said, "I felt so bad for how terribly she was treated." I felt so awful, I had to bring her back just so people know she's okay. Uh, I don't really do that. Um, well, I do have to say the characters are incredibly appealing, as flawed as they are, mm -hmm. as narrators. And yeah. they're uh, much less sympathetic characters when portrayed by the other. Mm -hmm. And that's really palpable, because Sogolon, mm -hmm. I would not have seen as the person you introduce us to in the second mm -hmm. book, who becomes this incredibly complex, deep, moving character, uh, who was kind of removed and austere and in and out of the shadows yeah. in the first well, book. Well, because Tracker doesn't know that, and he also doesn't care. Yeah. And, and He's brash. He's brash and he's kind of an idiot. <laughs> Um, but he's adorable. He's lovable somehow, even though yeah. you kind of want to kill him. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I, funny enough, I had to fall for him when I was writing because I didn't like him either. <laughs> when when I was writing it, I, I kind of had to fall for him, fall for him myself. Mm -hmm. um, Sogolan, I knew I was gonna like. <laughs> right. um, even even when even in in um, when I wrote her in in Black Leopard. Um, also because there are a few characters that are more fun to write than an old black woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I mean, she's not even 60, she's 177, she is 
done with your shit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, she looks great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I may have written the oldest character in a sex scene. <laughs> The girl got needs. Yeah. She's 177 years old. Come on. She got needs. Um, but, and that was, you know, but, but even that, it was just, um, I, she's just, to me, so ferociously alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, all, both novels begin and end in the same place, mm-hmm. in, in that prison. And Sogolan makes it very clear, you know, I'm not in here with you. You're all in here with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm really only here until I get bored. Right, she's right. She's kind of counting. She's the kind years. of like she's like, all right, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be with you guys for maybe eight years, and yeah. then I gotta. Then go. I got stuff to do. I got stuff to go. I got people to kill, <laughs> and and she makes it very clear yeah. that I am really just biding my yeah. time here. So you mentioned your Jamaican upbringing and storytelling, mm-hmm. and your grandfather telling you story. This. This is really in tone and vibe, very much seeped in African mythology, music, the rhythm, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering how you immersed yourself in African storytelling. Um, I mean, a lot of a, a, a lot of um, original sources. I mean, yes, I read all the history books. Um, if the history book was written before 1960, you read it for comic relief. <laughs> Because they're hilarious and so ridiculous and stupid, um, you know. It's it's. I was like, God bless Britannia. <laughs> Actually, no, no, no. <laughs> Can you tell I'm still pissed off that William and Kate came to my damn country? Anyway, um, <laughs> so I, there's a lot of that, but also, and this is something that's happening recently. Now, I was reading this book, Fistful of Shells, and it was it touched on it in a way, and and there are other books that are starting to take seriously oral histories and um, you know stuff passed on from the griots and so on and one of the things people used to say about say a griot song is that it's influenced by the powerful people in history and I went you mean like history? <laughs> I was like when was the last time you read a history book? Um, so I, you know, as many of those original sources I could find, all the original epics, the epic of Askia Muhammad, the epic of Sanjara, the real Lion King, um, you know, present day research, um, a lot of stuff on, so on folklore. See, I didn't know a lot of folklore mm-hmm. growing up, but I didn't know mythology. Mm-hmm. And they are different. They're one comes from the other, but if you only know folklore, you have a kind of an amputated sense of self. I mean, I do believe what um, Margaret Atwood says, you know, that um, you can always tell human nature by the mythologies. Mm-hmm. So if you don't grow up with the mythologies, then you, there's a huge aspect of your human nature that you don't know, at least I didn't know. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of that. And, um, you know, I started, like, really researching all this stuff in 2014. Mm-hmm. So before Brief History even came out. And, uh, and it's something I'm constantly reading and constantly, you know, sort of immersing myself into. I actually haven't been on the continent since 2013, hmm. um, when I was in Abiyakuta in Nigeria. I haven't been back um, there since, and I want to go back soon. But yeah, it was, I, I, I research enough or learn enough that I can move through the story as if it's been there all along. Because mm-hmm. even though it's new for me and it's new for the reader, it's not new for the character. Yeah. So I have to know enough that the characters can be kind of over it or the book is going to feel like a tourist report. Now, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, you're known and lauded for your literary prowess. And here you give yourself this quite intense constraint of mm-hmm. speaking in a dialect that isn't yours mm-hmm. and, um, and a storytelling and folklore that isn't what you grew up with, mm-hmm. even if it's influenced by some of your own experiences. Was that challenging for you to still find the poetry, even though it's Sogolon saying these things? She would say things sometimes in the most stunningly poetic ways, mm-hmm. but you maintained it sounding like it came from her. I remember, sorry, mm-hmm. just, I remember one scene where she discovers these bodies and she, they're rotting in the sun and she says, um, women and men melting in the sun and whispering rot on the breeze. Mm -hmm. So you're maintaining your control of the language but still giving it to your character. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's, 
I mean, I, I, you know, I'm still, at least to me, I'm still writing a novel. And, um, and I'm still very much inspired by the stuff I'm reading. One of the things about when you go back and read the old stories is that there is poetry in it, and there is rhythm in it, and there is music in it, even regardless of what you're talking about. And I think it's very easy to sort of trivialize or sentimentalize that. You know, people are like, these African people, they're so lyrical. You know, or, or so on. I used well, to be, they swear a lot too. And yeah, there, there's a lot of, as you say, funk and stink. Yeah, yeah, there is. But it's, it, you know, a lot of that though came from me reading a lot of those stories and all those songs and and the poetry and so on, and realizing that they aren't necessarily separate. Um, you know, and they form a sort of a, th that musicality and that orality. They aren't necessarily separate, and I think that's just part of. Of how of how they how they speak. I forgot. I was going to answer the first part of that question, but I can't remember it now. Of the question. <laughs> oh, just immersing yourself. Right. The constraint, mm -hmm. knowing you have control over prose, and choosing to impose on yourself this very challenging mm -hmm. constraint. So, like, how, mm -hmm. how you know how hard was that for you to write something in such a different style? It of didn't voice? seem because it didn't seem that different to me. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that felt like a homecoming. You know, when I was, you know, when I was, um, there isn't, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't, I don't, I'm not necessarily trying to write pigeon in the book, but I did do a lot of work on it. And, and, and it's always surprising. Pigeon is not, not pigeon and Jamaican Pato are quite different, mm. but it's always surprising when, when they're, they're similar and there's something that just, something just explodes in my head. Like, mm. you know, both of us, both pigeon and Jamaican Pato, we pluralize with them. We don't say the books, we said the book them. You know the care of them, yeah. and 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 so I there was enough of familiarity that even if there, the, it doesn't come out sounding the same, like Antigua and, and Jamaican dialects sound exactly the same until you get to certain words. Mm -hmm. So even so, I still felt free actually, mm -hmm. as opposed to restricted mm -hmm. um, in these things. There's also a part of me that feels you know as somebody in the diaspora that I, I, I do feel a certain sense of entitlement. Mm. You know, I remember I got into this argument with this white guy, this white musician, and he was cha challenging me and all these blues people who I didn't know. And you don't know Lightning Hopkins, I actually knew who Lightning Hopkins was, but I just like seeing what an asshole he was. <laughs> you, you don't know the blah, blah, blah. I was like, I know more blues than you. And I went, motherfucker, I am the blues. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't need to know it. <laughs> you know? Um, which is not to say, motherfucker, I am African, because that is very problematic. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there was, it was, you know what it was? It was a, such a homecoming. Mm -hmm. You know, here's, for example, something that came out of the research. I didn't go to the research looking for validation as a queer person. I didn't. And of course, I drink the Kool-Aid that everybody else drinks. Africans hate homosexuals, and, mm. and, they're, they're, and there's, there's some serious anti-gay legislation in Nigeria, and that's a fact. Mm -hmm. I was just talking about it um, late yesterday with Elosa Sunday, who has a novel called Vagabonds, which you should all read. It's amazing. But I did a, when, I, when I went and started doing some of the research and realizing the many ways in which African societies absorb and celebrate queerness mm. and transness, I said to I said to sometimes to, to like um, black friends, you notice you never had a problem calling a single person them. Hmm. You know, yeah. so we, we've done it forever. Right. Hmm. Um, and you know, there there's um, sugar is a pejorative certain parts in Africa, but there's a time when there are certain warriors. Like if I need to transport my virgin princess across to such and such, I trust this posse of soldiers because everybody knows they're gay. And it's like, well, we know nothing is going to happen to my precious flower with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which is, you know, it's something that, that, that you know, I, I've noticed also didn't survive the slave ship. That you're going to a lot of black American communities, yes, that, that is the town homo, but he's our homo. <laughs> you know, that's the town loose woman, but she's our loose woman. And, uh, and there's always been this huge capacity in blackness to absorb mm -hmm. and to, to, to broaden community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something I, that came into the research. I wasn't going looking for, yeah. for it, but I found it. Well, Chakker um, 
loves his people and his uh Oh my god, Francis, I thought you were gonna say Tracker loves dick. I was like, I was like this is I a, I I like, this is a family <laughs> thing. <laughs> I think Sogolon says that, doesn't she? She kinda does, yeah. Well, um, but one of the men he loves says, um, nobody loves no one. Mm -hmm. And Sogolon repeats it in the second book, which mm -hmm. I was really struck by. There's not a lot of love to go around in this book, mm -hmm. but Tracker is a passionate character, and he yeah. loves, but he loves in a brittle and mm. juvenile way. So he falls in love with these men, but he kind of can't, yeah. he can't really cope yeah. with it. Yeah, it's funny. One of the things that I had to train myself to stop is having all these pop culture references land in a book. Okay. Um, and I didn't notice Especially any. lyrics, because Nobody Loves No One is straight up Chris Isaac. <laughs> I don't know when I was listening to Wicked Game. <laughs> yeah. And I remember somebody in it said, um, it's hard walking in a dress, it's not easy. I'm like, shit, PJ Harvey's going to sue me. <laughs> uh, there's so many PJ Harvey just lyrics. You just changed a couple words here yeah. and there. I thought I yeah. noticed one Rolling Stones <laughs> reference, too. I noticed a PJ Harvey one. Yeah. You noticed one, too? I can't remember which one it was. I can't remember we'll, either. We'll bring it up in the Q&A. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's, track, you know the thing is, it's, it's a surprise to Tracker because it was a surprise to me that Tracker mm -hmm. is looking for love. Mm -hmm. Because I like to tell myself, I'm a literary fiction author, I don't do that shit. <laughs> um, except it's like the third time I've done it now. <laughs> um, but he is, and he doesn't know he is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's same as though, and I think one of the things that Tracker and Sutherland have in common is that they don't know that they're looking for family. Mm -hmm. So when they finally have it, it kind of stuns them. Mm -hmm. and, and of course stuff happens, but it's, it's um, I guess it stuns them because it surprises me because I, I, I will always deny that I don't write about love as a concept. Mm -hmm. like, like I just don't do it. But it always crops up and it always crops up by a surprise because it, it hits me as mm -hmm. a surprise. It almost hits you more because there is so little of it in the book. There's what? So little of it. Mm -hmm. the, the search for love feels so repressed and restrained mm -hmm. that when it pops out, it just, it's, it's very jarring. And, yeah. Uh, and, and Sutherland and Tracker come from such different backgrounds where they experience lovelessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sutherland, of course, she grew up in a pretty terrible household. Mm -hmm. But then she goes you know, to this royal court and realizes there's none of that there either. Right. It's right. all about, you right. know, right. jacking position, backstabbing, mm -hmm. whatever. She's um, very surprised by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, not that she has anything to judge it against. Mm -hmm. But um, she, she, I don't think Sogolon gets cynical, but I think she gets sort of wizened pretty early mm -hmm. um, yeah. about that. And she has, and she has, you know, she has her guard up. So I wanted to ask you, because there's so much in this book, we've already touched on some of it, but mm -hmm. about genre breaking, we invited you, specifically we decided, oh, this might be cool for our science versus fiction series, even though this is not sci-fi. I think mm -hmm. one of the things I love is genre bending in mm -hmm. general, right? Science doesn't have to mean future, it can mean yeah. past. It doesn't have to mean gadgets, it can mean nature. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, naturalism folded around the witches mm -hmm. and the demigods and the monsters and the ghouls. There's also this kind of African naturalism of the hyenas and mm -hmm. the lions and the elephants and this reverence for nature. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that connect with naturalism versus this uh, rules you've bent to make mm -hmm. this fantastical world. Yeah, I am. Um, one of the, without falling into this kind of cliched African tribal, they're they're closer to the earth kind of thing, because I think there is this sort of of um, literary primitivity that some people have a fetish for. Um, you know, I like when Perry said, you know, every sixty seconds in Africa is a minute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 so I wanted to go beyond that. Like, um, Tracker comes across this place. It's sort of like a savanna and it's not doing well. And, and he says, I don't know if he says it, somebody says they aren't doing well because the trees don't speak to each other, which can sound like sort of mystical mumbo jumbo. 
until they know the science and know how trees communicate and how you know fungi is almost the tree internet. And the ways in which they, you know, how uh, trees will send nutrients to one that just got chopped down, which is why that branch is still there. And a lot of that is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, was, I was actually surprised how much actual science I was reading hmm. when I was writing this. Because one, I just had a sense that Western science was catching up to stuff people already knew. Um, in Book of Night Woman, um, uh, Homer at one point said, you know, if they had only treat us nice, we'd show them how to grow canes three times as big. Hmm. Right. Um, you know, that, that kind of, that science and nature, which we sometimes sup, sup, um, separate, and people realize it's actually a pretty recent separation. Yeah. Um, you know, or science and art, it's a pretty recent separation. Oh, great, yeah, for um, sure. Is, wouldn't have occurred to somebody like Soglon or to the people like mm -hmm. that. That, um, you know, when they talk about white science and black math, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's knowledge and it's, it's technology. I call it like black secret net technology, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, also a guy called Gerald Album. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, I, 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 I knew I wanted to write something where things that we consider discoveries they take for granted because mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of that is there the first time i went to chichen itza um it blew my mind that they knew a year was 365 days mm -hmm. and that the world was round yeah um amazing you know, astronomers yeah amazing yeah the, like some of the cosmologies i was reading when writing this book i read a lot of dogon cosmology because mm. they had a sense of the solar system and the planets long ago. Nobody had to tell them that mm. the earth moved around the sun, not the other way around. Mm. And, and just how much of that type of knowledge and intelligence was there, you know, was there all along. Yeah, Sogolon is definitely seeking knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're saying really, I felt as this overarching theme in the entire book because while there are these fantastical themes, they still mock each other for believing in vapid superstitions mm -hmm. that don't cohere with the world that they observe. And mm -hmm. they do not appreciate that, even if there are shapeshifters mm -hmm. and um, vampires. <laughs> they don't appreciate people who aren't in that reality, whatever yeah. that reality was that you created. Mm -hmm. um, and there are these sort of rules as that make it a consistent universe in the multiverse, right? That has its own ways of playing out. Yeah, I think they also have their own ideas of what, because their, their own ideas of what's fantastical and their own ideas of what's not real. Mm -hmm. And their own ideas of basically what's bullshit. <laughs> so they're quite over the idea of shapeshifters. Um, Sogolan at one point, you know, was basically saying she don't understand why why her her great 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 granddaughter is being so cagey about her boyfriend? I'm like, she's like, I fuck lions. What's so wrong with fucking a snake? It's like, gee. <laughs> um, but it's it's the, the shape shifting is taken up for granted, mm -hmm. as opposed to it being a part where somebody show their you know show their superpowers. Yeah. Um, but at the same time. You know, Soglan is still amazed by, you know, by military maneuvers. She's amazed by stuff like writing. Mm -hmm. She's, yeah, she um, learns to read and write. Yeah. Over the course and, of the book. Yeah, and, and so there are things even, you know, for, for her world and her perception, you know, this is crazy or this is, this is, this is um, you know, this is not real. Mm -hmm. you, you were discussing the storytelling, the fact that Sogolam learns to read and write is mm -hmm. a very crucial uh, step in this process. I also remember in the second book there's an allusion to the fact that it's the first time in this world that there's recorded history mm -hmm. on parchment. And there seems to be this overarching theme about, and you've already mentioned it earlier, who owns the story, yeah. who gets to tell the history, and you specifically chose these characters of humble origins, mm -hmm. and not the kings, and the griots, and, uh, mm -hmm. and the generals. Yeah, because I think everybody has, because those people have an agenda and they have an allegiance. And there are certainly stories, we've never, we've never been short of those kind of stories. 
Um, but it, it, also because one of the things that um, those they call the Southern Griots in the story realize is that time keeps changing and the world keeps shifting and people keep forgetting. And yes, in the book, there's an actual reason why. But it happens all the time in history. We forget all the time. And um, they, he's upon the whole idea that, you know, if that paper can't forget mm-hmm. and that something written down or marked in some way can't, you know, can't forget. And, and that, so it becomes, it becomes a tool for preserving history, but it also becomes something they have to hide because if, if in, a, in a world where forgetting is important, forgetting is currency, as a person who remembers, you become a threat, which is why Sogolan initially becomes a threat mm-hmm. in the novel because everybody was forgetting about her. Yeah, and there's a character, the Aisi, who's yeah. very important in this book, who can also wipe memories. Mm-hmm. People see the Aisi who stands next to the king. The spider king yeah. is known as the spider king because he has four arms and four legs because the Aisi mm-hmm. has an extra set of arms and legs, yeah. like a spider. And the Aisi can erase memories, and this yeah. is one of his superpowers. It's one of his superpowers. But the thing about Aisi that... Um, I mean, I'm not exactly a friend of him, but I do share his worldview. Bad dude, man. I know, but I share his worldview. Man. It's, it's like you know, I, everyone was writing brief history, and I'm like, man, all these people kill so many people, but damn, their worldview is refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know, all it, these people have killed a lot of people. Tracker, yeah. Aisi, Sogolon. Yeah, but Aisi. One of the things that happens at the core, or, or put it this way, at the core of, of Moonwitch and to a lesser extent Black Leopard are two different visions of the future. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Sogolon has one, or at least she, she inherits one, where we have to restore this normal, the, the natural line mm-hmm. of kings. And, you know, and Aes's view of the future is we're under siege mm-hmm. and, and a threat is coming and this, whatever you think is the future, can't handle it, can't withstand it, and we're gonna lose. Mm-hmm. And there's a part of me that, um, and I, I, didn't like, I didn't necessarily tie it into actual events, but there is this, this idea that the land got weakened, that's why foreigners could invade it, and enslave it, and so on. And, and, and you know, the AEC sees the future and it's not great. I mean, he's not the best person in the world. He's not above killing a few hundred thousand people, you know. But damn, if he's not right, it's kind of like Killmonger in Black in, in Black Panther, who I did not rip off. Mm-hmm. But I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's the villain, but damn, he's on the right side of history. And the history is being written right now by Tracker and Sogolon, who, as you mentioned. They open by telling an inquisitor their story. Mm-hmm. Do we learn more about the inquisitor later? In the, one, the third one? Yeah. I, gonna, I, I'm <laughs> you're going to have to read it to find out. <laughs> uh, Do you know yet? I know. I, mean, not even my, I, I, I haven't even told my editor who's telling. The so third you're not going to tell us? No, definitely not. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, the name of it, the, the third one is called White Wing Dark Star. White Wing Dark Star? Yeah. You heard it here first, but... So you can start all sorts of theories about who that is. <laughs> Sorry, say that again? So they can start all sorts of theories about who that is. Okay, right, um, and right. So on. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a secret. I, you know, the... the um, <laughs> That's a pretty good Yeah, clue, the interrogator is interesting to me because ultimately both, both novels are sort of eyewitness testimonies and he rarely appears. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even though um, Sutherland's theory is that he's a Southern Griot who betrayed everybody else, mm-hmm. and Tracker has a whole bunch of ideas about who this man is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think he might. Um, I'm not necessarily that interested in his story, though. Mm-hmm. Well, so even just the very idea that it's being recorded now, there are oral stories, and they mm-hmm. each one of them wants their story to triumph over the others. You're very anxious that the other mm. one is going to get their tail out first. Right, and, and the good thing is they don't know each other's story. Yeah. Which is why I kind of had to forget Black Leopard when I was writing this. Mm-hmm. 
or I'd have just I would have just written a reaction to the first yeah. book. The whole, both the books are incredibly filmic. Mm-hmm. And um, did you think about that when you were writing it? Did you visualize um, it in? I mean, in yes film and, and screen, I mean, small I, or big. I mean, yes and no. There are a few things that annoy me more when I can tell a writer is writing for the movie. How can you tell? Because that's the way it is. I remember when I read The Ruins. And, and, and the author is a great author. He wrote a great novel before, but I read it and I'm like, man, I can just tell the close ups. Um, <laughs> you know? But at the same time, I'm hugely inspired by cinema. Um, it's, you know, there, I, I like the, you know, the, econ- the economy. Um, in, you know, I was, when I'm teaching writing, I'm always telling my students, you know, a sunset doesn't need your help. Yeah, just tell us the damn sunset. I don't need a metaphor for a sunset. Right. A sunset itself is fine. Right. And a lot of it is from film, that a film has to find depth in the whole actuality of the scene, mm-hmm. unless you're going to have some jackass narrating something metaphoric underneath it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm always inspired by that. I'm inspired by letting the actual physical and sensory details of the scene fill out a scene before reaching for a metaphor, a simile, or illusion, mm-hmm. all the things that I really love. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that gets in the way of just the, the beauty and poetry of what's, you know, mm-hmm. what's in front of you. So I'm, I'm hugely inspired by, by film and so on. But at the same time, I had to stop myself from falling into that trap where you can tell the person is just writing a, a screenplay. Now, the screen rights have been sold, the film rights. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Michael B. Jordan's company bought, bought it a few years ago. Um, then COVID <laughs> happened. So I think we're, we're back on track. It's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Is there a time scale for that? Damn if I know. I hope there were. I need to be paid. Like, <laughs> right. New York houses don't buy themselves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're you know, um, Tyrell, Tyrell McCrane, who wrote Moonlight, is mm-hmm. writing a screenplay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Exciting. So you some, already have a writer attached. Yeah. Are you going to be in the writer's room? Hell no. No? I've been enough. I, I, one was enough. <laughs> Which one were you in? Well, uh, well uh, so I'm working on this detective show for HBO. Okay. And, um, and it's not based on your book. It's not based on anything. It's based, it's, it, it's based on a letter, a, a treatment I wrote to get rid of a producer. Okay. Because they were nagging me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a treatment for a Jamaican show with a Jamaican detective, with a Jamaican cast. Everybody speaks Patois. They'll all <laughs> flip in. They'll hate it. And they loved it. And they went, I, we love it. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're making it. We're actually, you know, we, we're literally going to bring down trailers mm-hmm. for the actresses and actors and, and so on. And it's called, it's, it's sort of a riff on 70s shows like Get Carter. So it's called Get Millie Black. <laughs> And, and yeah, we, we, we no, we're, you know, it's an actual show. The thing I wrote to get rid of people <laughs> is not an actual TV show. I want to open this up for questions for people. Um, mm-hmm. But before I do, because I could talk to you yes. all night, I just, I, I do uh, want to just try sneakily, mm-hmm. <laughs> so nobody else is allowed to ask him this but me. <laughs> Are you sure no more clues about who the narrator is? No, I'm not telling you, no. <laughs> <laughs> because then I'll get a message from my editor like, wow, you told everybody in Red Hook, but you couldn't tell me, your editor, who is... Who's. Now I'm pretty good with secrets. Yeah, well, um, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> no, He's a person that tell that, tell that's the problem. <laughs> that's, no, it's really exciting. I can't wait. I read both books. Like I said, I read them out of order, and I listened to both books. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to say, there's a lot of the characters I kept referencing back to because you have character lists, which is really fascinating, and also maps. The maps are really fun to find your way through the north. Maps are great. I had to reteach myself you drew Photoshop. The maps. I drew them. Yeah. Because um, before mm-hmm. you Should know the maps? becoming some sort of author, I was a, I was a graphic designer and a. And an illustrator. This is part of the Northlands. That's part of the Northlands. Here's here, let's see. 
will show uh, here's the whole Northlands. Yeah. A little bit. Uh, no, no Southlands. That's the Southlands. Oh, there. Oh, that's the Southlands. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I um. Yeah. I had to reteach myself Illustrator and Photoshop and all that stuff. I hadn't realized you did the maps until tonight. Is what? I didn't realize you did the maps. Until yeah. Tonight. I am. Um, um, you know, I'm available if anybody. <laughs> I am so not cheap, um, but yeah, it was it was it was interesting going back to that because that's the feel like that's what I came out of really graphic design yeah. and mm. and and so on and and um, it was interesting going back. Yeah. I don't think I make a permanent job out of it though. <laughs> well, uh, before we open it to questions, uh, I want to thank you so much, Marlon. It's such you. a pleasure to talk to you. Please join me in thank thanking you so much. <laughs> We have a mic over here. If you have a question, jump up to the mic. Uh, how much editing do you do? Uh, what is a writing day for you? Uh, do you? Do you write like with the discipline of a Stephen King? Uh, or do you do it whenever you feel you know, moved? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and and how, do you, how do you come to the themes that seem to thread through your, your novels? Um. It's a bunch of questions there, maybe. Um, in terms of writing, I actually, I mean, to me, I, you know, I write in a very sort of nine to five way. I, you know, I, I hit the desk like at 10 and I stay there till around six. And, and I don't really care where I'm in a story, I stop. Because um, I really love to not write. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and I'm very big on that. Um, one of my creative writing teachers once said, if you, if you set a routine, the muses will show up. And I'm a big believer of that. Um, you know, people have a lot of negative, negative um, connotations to the word routine, so I just change it to practice. So the practice and the, and the muses will show up. Um, as for like themes and stuff in, 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 your, in my work, I think you have to get to the point where they flow in an organic way and trust that you'll hit them. Because I think if you are a writer, the things that matter the most to you in the world will come out in the writing and will come out in the most unexpected ways. Because the, the problem with trying to stage a writer is kind of like planning an accident. And, or what you end up with is this sort of signposting where you, you, your book screams, I'm talking about poverty here, you know, kind of thing. And I think that you, you I, what I, I told myself once, and this might make no sense, is that you have to trust your subconscious to be a better writer than you. And that just the, way, the things that matter the most to you will come out in a writing in an organic way. That doesn't mean it can't be deliberate. It doesn't mean that um, there are a lot of times my characters say things when it's absolutely, totally me saying it. And... Uh, you know, and I, 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 you know, I'm somebody who absolutely loves my own pettiness. Like, I had a character who is based on this visa officer who, was, who humiliated me once at a visa office in Jamaica. <laughs> so I wrote a story where she's, she's in it and ends up in a freak accident and dies. <laughs> because I'm petty as fuck. <laughs> Editing. I, yes and no. I, I'm a big believer in writing to the end before looking back. Um, not every writer is like that. My friend Kaylee, Kaylee Jones is absolutely not that. Um, Kaylee can't, Kaylee will, I, I, I'm putting words in her mouth, but I know, and she may not write every book like that, but I know she, uh, she reminds me of other, other writers who can't move to part two unless they feel secure about part one. Like, when they feel this is it, this is working, then they feel confident to go on. And there are a lot of writers who are like that. And if you're that kind of writer, you should know who you are. I am not that writer. I have to see everything to the end, knowing that whatever I wrote is utter horse shit, because I know I'm gonna rewrite it. So I, you know, um, I'm, I, I like to tell myself I've gotten better at it now. No, I'm like, maybe four drafts. Um, Brief history was actually, the, 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 the draft that got printed was draft 9B. So you should know there was a 9A. <laughs> um, it's, you know, editing, 
I, the reason why, to come back to the editing question, I, I write without editing the first draft. Because for me, if I'm editing while I'm writing, I'm correcting. And for me, what happens is I, you, you realize you're not creating, you're correcting. And again, that does not apply to everybody. And as I said before, people who cannot move, think creatively unless A is settled so I can think creatively about B. But for me, I, editing for me is a second or third draft thing. Um, certainly stuff like dialogue. But it's very easy because it's very easy when you're editing to let your crit inner critic get in the way. And I, I know a lot of people who say this with pride that they're their own worst, their own harshest critic. Trust me, if you're any form of artist, that job's already taken. <laughs> your harshest critic is already writing a shitty review of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't need that. You don't need to apply for that job. That job's taken. <laughs> Find another version of a critic because harshest critic has already been filled. Um, and you know what you should. What, to me, I, I, I think you can be your most generous critic, um, and you can still be honest. You know, is people say people read it and be brutal. I'm like, then you want didn't have a butcher read it. I was like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's for me. It's um, editing for me is a second or third or fourth or fifth draft thing. Please, mm -hmm. next question. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, okay. No, no. Both Schracker and Sogolon are very unreliable uh, narrators. Mm -hmm. How much is, of that is because they're lying to the Inquisitor, and how much of that is because of the IAC's powers? Um, a lot of it. I don't think any of it is really the IAC's powers. I think it's they are telling their version of a story. But I like you brought up the whole idea of unreliable narrators because that's a very, the whole idea of an unreliable narrative is a very Western thing. Um, I do this um, podcast with my editor called Marlon and Jake Read Dead People. Yeah, um, so I've seen that. Yeah. You're really brutal to yeah. dead people. You well, said that's why they have to be dead. they're dead. <laughs> and they can't come back as ghosts because I used to be an exorcist. That's a true story. <laughs> so I'm ready for any flipping ghost. Yes, I was an exorcist. Um, I totally forget where I was going with this now because I got distracted with exorcism. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, how much of them oh, being right, right, unreliable? Right. So what I was going with, it, so the, the idea, one of the things we talked about in one of our podcasts is the whole idea of reliable and unreliable narrators, that if you were versed in the oral tradition, um, whether it's African folklore or you had a grandmother who told you stories, those characters are always unreliable. And if, if one, of the things, one, one of the things that's really interesting about oral traditions is that the listener had to be a more discerning person than a reader. Because yes, I'm trying to trick you, and you as a listener should pick up on it. So if I'm telling you an Anansi story, Anansi is either about the trickster or I am trying to trick you. The, the, the point being that it's not even a matter of reliable or unreliable, it's a matter of what of this are you going to believe. Um, the burden of truth then falls on what you choose as opposed to you know, what the person is telling you. So, well, so which, is a way, which is another way of saying that when I wrote Sutherland's story, I absolutely believed every word she said. Um, but when I wrote Tracker's story, I absolutely believed everything he said too. Yeah. Hi, I've got a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, first part is, who are the writers who inspire you? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, what do you learn? I know that you teach. What do you feel that you learn from your students? Um, writer, oh Lord. I keep thinking of the writers I reread every time I, I write a book. I, um, for this novel, two books were on my desk the whole time, Wolf Hall and Beloved. Um, it goes without saying how much I'm in awe of Toni Morrison. I just wrote an introduction for a new edition of Song of Solomon. Humble brag. Um, <laughs> I still can't believe it happened. So, um, and, and, and Hilary Mantel, of course, um, I think Wolf Hall is an, actually an, a, a genuinely perfect novel. Um, it, who else have been, I'm trying to think of people I'm inspired by. Um, I read Jessica Hagedorn quite a bit. I reread Dog Eaters all the time. Um, I was talking about it just last night. So the first time I read Dog Eaters, I thought it was the best novel about Jamaica ever written. 
but it's set in the Philippines. <laughs> and if you've ever been to Kingston, then you understand Manila. And if you've been to Manila, you understand Cape Town. And if you've been to Cape Town, you understand Mexico City. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're landing these cities and you go, oh yeah, I know this. You even, you even know when the con is coming towards you. It's like, dude, I, I mean, from Kingston, you can't come to me with that Cape Town jack, jack foolishness. Um, so, you, and what I, what, what I, um, I think from, from, I mean, I get different things from, from all, all these authors. Um, the one thing I think they have in common is that they all wrote the story they wanted to read. Um, and I'm inspired by authors who sort of almost write their own readership into being. Um, you know, people who, who, you know, I'm not saying I'm trying to necessarily breaking new ground because, you know, there is al there's already tons of African sci-fi and African fantasy. And um, uh, if, even if you go as far back as Amos Tutuola and Dio Faguna, um, you'll find those stories there. And I read those stories um, back and forth. And I have completely forgot the second part of that question. Uh, students, how do, are you, do your students inspire you? Does teaching inspire you? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, yeah exam, you know, my students inspire me all the time. I teach undergrads. So a lot of them don't even know if they want to write yet. Um, you know, as a, every now and then you'll come across a student who's like, well, you know, I've written three novels and I'm really focused on such and such. And, and, you, and, and you're like, I get it. You read Sabald over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Power G. Anyway, um, you know, I remember once this student came to me, um, uh, one of my, you know, a trans student, and, um, you know, they said to me, have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about in, in uh, you know, well, they were saying, you, can you imagine as somebody with mental illness, how many times in a classroom, this class, the other writing class, on TV, in film, in comics, how many times I have to deal with people linking mental illness to criminality? As I, I never thought of it. So that person kills four people where they go, he must have been insane. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it before, that whole link between mental illness and so-called senseless violence. That that person who kills somebody is not mentally ill, they're an asshole. You know, <laughs> you know that, um, and I never thought about it. I never thought about it until until they pointed it out to me. Mm -hmm. And it's something. No, I almost begin every class I teach. I'm not telling people what to write, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that there isn't something there. But I'm saying the idea of the psycho killer. Maybe you should put that one to bed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I didn't think about that's that's the ways in which that's a an actually specific way in which student a student inspired me. I get the last question before ah. we get off stage. And my question is, when did you realize you wanted to be a writer? You're describing that your students don't know. Mm -hmm. You were a graphic designer. You've done other things. You've thought about other things. You were an exorcist, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when did you realize you wanted to write? Well, you know, in between sending demons to hell. <laughs> and that's not, that's not, that's also not how it works. <laughs> Y'all watch too many horror films, that's not how it works. Um, you know, I, I turned to writing pretty, I mean, I can't remember the year exactly, but I remember turning back to it because I wanted something I created that was mine. So my first novel, I didn't actually write it to be published, which probably explains why I couldn't publish it. But I- It's not published. Uh, no, not it, was, published. it was published after, after all, Akashic Books put it out. Um, years, years, years ago. Um, but I, you know, I was in advertising, I was in, I was writing copy, I'd write thing, you know, things, you know, like, um, such and such deodorant keeps you confident, <laughs> or some shit like that. Um, so, but I was, I was used to, uh, used to sort of um, writing for product, writing for whatever, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's great to be creative and make money. But I, I turned to fiction because I wanted to write something that was just for me. And I still believe that, that if you're, if you're any form of artist, the first person you create for is yourself. Um, and people respond to it, that's great. If people don't respond to it, that's also great. But that's what it was. It was, it was, it was um, me trying to find something that was mine, because I think I think there's a difference between a graphic artist and an artist doing graphics. And both are perfectly fine, but know who you are. 
I think there's a difference between a copywriter and a writer doing copy. Again, both are fine, but know who you are. Because if you're a writer doing copy, then the bulk of your creative life is spent in compromise. And you're going to pay for that at some point, I think. If you're an artist doing that, you, a large part of your life is spent creating in compromise. I mean, you know, people got to eat. And I'm a big believer in that, and I do love money. But <laughs> <laughs> and eating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, these clothes don't buy themselves. But I think you do have to know, and I think you do have to have some sort of strategy as to how you're going to protect your creativity and how you're going to find a way to be yourself as an artist. Because I think all of that years and years of compromise will start to cost you. Uh, you know, I, I, I run into friends who have you know, been doing advertising for 40, 50 years, and I'm like, I'm going to write that novel now. And I'm like, girl, that's not going to happen. That's not exactly what I said. Like, you go, you. Because that, I know no, no novel is coming. Because it's, 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 um, it's very, I think it's important. I think if, if, you know, that's what I did initially when I started writing. It was a means to try to save what I thought was my creativity. Marlon, amazing. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. I'm so honored you made it tonight. Oh, the thank books you. are so vivid and exciting. I hope everyone reads them. Join me in thank thanking Marlon. Thank you guys Marlon so much. Jay. Thank you.